that we've gotten since it was printed. Um, as you see, Minnie Lincoln will be having surgery tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. at Williamson Medical. So I know she would like to be remembered in our prayers tomorrow as uh, she's going through that. Um, we want to remember the entire Smithson family. Um, this afternoon or today sometime, Jimmy Smithson was taken to Murray Regional, um, but he is back at home now resting. Uh, while that was going on, Doug Smithson was found unresponsive at home. So he is also at Murray Regional. As, as far as we know right now, they're running tests to figure out what had happened uh, there. And as, as you see on the announcement page, Nellie's due to have a surgical procedure tomorrow. So the Smithsons have a lot going on right now, and I know they like to be remembered in our prayers um, as we go throughout our week. On the back of the uh, announcement page, there's a lot of things going on here at Southern Hills. One thing to mention is next Wednesday, uh, there will be no classes. We'll be having a, a, a singing here in the auditorium, so just keep that in mind. There'll be no classes next Wednesday with a singing here in the auditorium. The blood drive is coming up on Friday, so if you have not signed up and you're able to give blood, uh, please sign up on, a, on the sign-up sheet in the back, or a, I believe it says on here you can go online and sign up at the Red Cross site. But um, any information, of, if you need any information about that, see Garrett Moore, um, he can fill you in on that. And then a couple of changes to our class schedule tonight. Um, the, the day school is having a program. That's the reason we're all, looks a little different up here and the, the fellowship hall is different. So David Broom's class, which usually meets in the fellowship hall, is going to meet in room 100, which is where the young professionals generally meet. And the young professionals will join our young families in the uh, room across the hall. So uh, those couple of changes, and I think David's going to try and remind each of us um, right before we go to class. But those are the announcements that I have for tonight. If you would bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the night you have blessed us with, this time as we gather around your throne. Father, we lift the, lift the Smithson family up to you in, in all of their medical scares and concerns. We pray that you be with them and help them to figure out what is going on. Um, and help the doctors and nurses treat them accordingly so they can be back with us as soon as possible. Be with each one of us during this period of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first song this evening will be number 215, Hear Me When I Call, 215. If you're using our songbook and would like to mark the invitation song, it will be number 29 tonight, and that will be after our message. But before we're led in a prayer and have that message, we're going to sing number 262, 
I bring my sins to thee, 262. with me if you would. Lord, thank you for letting us all come here tonight to be together, to worship you, to study your word. We ask now that you help us to put aside our thoughts of uh, this world, of the things we've dealt with this week, and to center our minds and hearts on you and on your word. Help us to be there for one another uh, throughout this life to encourage one another. Help us to always be there to support our brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask that you be with those that are missing from our number tonight, those that are either traveling or sick or otherwise unable to be here, we ask that you uh, be with them and give them strength and comfort. Lord, we ask now that you continue to be with us and that you watch over us always. In your son's name, amen. This month we've been thinking about different things and I've been bringing during our devotional period, different things that I've been thankful for here at Southern Hills. And tonight I wanted us to think about and and be thankful for the eldership that we have here at Southern Hills. And I thought about the men that lead us here at Southern Hills and as they meet and discuss the the, the spiritual concerns here, I turned to a few two passages that I wanted us to look at. The first one is in Acts chapter 20 verses 28 through 29. And that reads, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. As I thought about our eldership and I thought about what they do as they meet, one thing they do is they truly guard this flock that meets here at Southern Hills. Not only guard us physically, not only think about our physical well-being to make sure everyone is okay physically, but they also guard us in what's being taught in our classes. I know they take our classes very seriously and they want to know what's being taught, they want to know who's teaching, and they want to make sure that what's being taught in our classes is, is based on Scripture. They also want to, they also try to take account of when, we act, when we're here and when we're not here. If there's a time that, that we miss several times in a row, I know they take that very seriously and they want to, to check in and make sure everyone's okay. So our, our elders take this passage very seriously and take their challenge to guard this flock very seriously as well. And then I turned over to First Peter chapter 5 verses 2 through 3. First Peter chapter 5 verses 2 through 3. Shepherd the flock of God which, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. 
Another thing I'm thankful for as I think about the men that, that serve as elders here is they are truly examples of how we need to live. Not only the way they live their personal lives, but also in the way they raise their families and the way that they deal with their business dealings. I know a lot of them take that very seriously in the example that they set for us. So tonight I'm, I'm thankful for our eldership here and the, the seriousness in which they take the office that they were, that they have been granted by the Holy Spirit as we've just read. So tonight I, I issue the invitation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If for any reason you need to come forward and ask for the prayers of the church, I encourage you to do that. Or if you haven't obeyed the gospel and, and need to do that, I encourage you to do that. We're ready and willing to, to help you in whatever way possible. If you would, come forward as we stand and sing. Thank you very much for helping me through that last one. I don't know what quite happened to my voice there. As I am supposed to do, I'd like to remind everybody of the change of venue of two of our classes tonight. Our young professionals class will be meeting across the hall from where they normally meet in the young families room. And my fellowship hall class will be meeting in room 100, which is down at the end of the hall that way. But before we go to those classes and we're dismissed in prayer, Let's sing number 436. Nearer, still nearer, number 436. <clears throat> Near.
Let's close in prayer. Righteous and eternal Father, we're so grateful and thankful for this period of worship that you've allowed us to have to come together as one to praise your name, Father, to glorify you with our words and our hearts. Father, we close this session as we ask you to consider blessing some that need you so desperately right now, Father. We pray for Minnie Lincoln as she has surgery, that you will bless those that are looking after her, that it will be a success. Please, Father, bless her. And we ask you to bless the Smithson family. Father, you know the struggles that they're having, and we just beg you, Father, to, in a special way to care for them, to give them the care that they need, Father. Help us to do whatever we can to encourage them through our words and our deeds, Father, to let them know how much you love them. Father, we are so grateful for our shepherds that lead us here at Southern Hills. Please bless them. Bless their families, their wives, their children, Father. Give them discernment and wisdom, Father, to lead us in the ways that you know that you would have this church prosper and grow. Help us be more evangelistic, Father. Help us look out into the world that needs you so desperately. Help us be willing to let our light shine so that others can see you living through us, that you and your Son may be glorified. So bless our period of study as we close. Father, forgive us when we fail you. Above all, thank you so much for your precious Son, Jesus, who paid the price for our sins. And it's through him we pray. Amen. Amen.
Please be turning your Bible. Are we picking up on both of these? Not? Oh, good. good. Okay. It just kind of sounds like there's an echo coming from somewhere. Okay. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to try to finish it tonight. I don't know that we will, but we will get as far as we can because this is the last night for this class because next week we will have singing, and then two weeks from tonight, I believe we start a new quarter, because that will be the first uh, Wednesday night in December. Okay, and it's, it's strange. I don't know that I've ever gotten used to it. You may not have either a Bible school quarter for the new year beginning the first Sunday in December. That just, that's, that's out of rhythm for some reason. But I remember when they did that, I don't remember why exactly, but uh, it was to make everybody, put everybody on the same page because the gospel advocate was doing its literature starting the first Sunday in December. So, if, and, and I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but uh, we all had to get in step. So that's where we are. So anyway, this is the last night for this. Let's do as much as we can. Chapter 6, verse 1. Let us... Okay. Ah. Let's try that. I was complaining about having two microphones and... Now all of a sudden I don't have any. I'll learn the hard way. All right, let's try this. 
Now let's try this. If y'all need to take a break and go back and get something else to eat, go ahead. I think I'm going to be at this a while. So, all right. Yay! Okay, try it again. All right, let's see what happens. It's much closer to my mouth than it was. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. In your mind, let's go back for just a minute here to chapter 5. In chapter 5, the theme was how to treat other people who are fellow Christians. And there was a contrast between the older and the younger, both men and women, in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Then there was an extended discussion of how to deal with widows in verses 3 through 16, and especially those who are referred to as widows indeed. And then the elders in chapter 5, verses 17 through 25, pretty extended discussion there of the elders. Now, the reason reason I've gone back to do that is because that theme continues in the opening verses of chapter 6 which I have just read. Here Paul is talking about the relationship that exists between masters and servants. Now after we get out of that, which won't take us very long, he's beginning to wind this letter down, if you will. He's beginning to bring it to a conclusion. And in verses 3 through 21, that's the rest of the chapter, he's going to deal with several things. Uh, error and greed in verses 3 through 10. The good confession in 11 through 16. How to deal with the rich in 17 through 19. And then he draws a conclusion in verses 20 and 21. That's kind of an overview of what takes place in this particular chapter chapter. Now let's go back and take it apart a piece at a time. The first thing he talks about in the first two verses, as we've already said, would be the relationship that exists between masters and servants, especially when both the masters and the servants are fellow Christians. Notice he says, let as many bond servants as are under the yoke. He's talking about a class of persons or a group of persons that existed in the ancient world in this particular time. Some people say that there are three distinctions made or three kinds of persons talked about in passages like this. Number one, there would be servants. Number two, there would be bond servants, and bond servants would be different from servants. Servants would be a higher grade. This might be household servants, for example. Then you go to the bond servants. That's a little bit more strict. They are bound by law or by agreement or by contract to be a servant of a person or a family for a period of time, and that might actually be forever. So you've got servants, then you've got bond servants, and the third group you've got is slaves. And they are a different group of people with a different name indicating that they are in servitude to their master perhaps for an entire lifetime. Perhaps they will live and die as well as servants or as slaves in this particular case. But these bond servants, if that is a distinct group, they are to count their own masters, the ones to whom they serve, worthy, deserving of all honor, and honor means respect. And you treat your master that way so that, now this is the New King James, purpose introduced by the Greek word henia, so that the name of God 
name in reference to God or in reference to Christ, as in Acts 2.38 and a lot of other places, indicates the authority of the person whose name this is. Here we're talking about the authority of God. We could just as well be talking about the authority of Christ, the Son of God. So that the name of God, the authority of God, and his doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. The teaching that originates with and comes from God. The teaching that we have in God's inspired word, the Bible. Slaves or bond servants or servants are to conduct themselves properly toward their masters so that the name or the authority of God and his doctrine or teaching will not be blasphemed. It will not be spoken evil of. It will not be spoken against. It will not be criticized or put down or made fun of. Because these bond servants are referred to as people who are under the yoke. Now, under the yoke is a figure of speech. There is somewhere in ancient history reference to a general or a force uh, capturing a number of slaves from another country or another group of people. And they would do something like you've seen. You've seen this in, in weddings at West Point, for example. They would uh, raise their swords and they would have these servants and slaves go under these swords. And that was supposed to symbolize that they were under the yoke. They were submitting themselves to their masters. Submitting themselves to their captors. And so they are under the yoke and they are obligated then to their own masters. That doesn't mean you're obligated to somebody else's master. But you are obligated to your own master. And by the way, the word behind the word master is the word despot. When we talk about a despot, we're usually talking about somebody who's a bad guy. Somebody who's overbearing, somebody who is vindictive, somebody who is demanding. That's not necessarily what this is. If you've got a master who is a Christian, he is not going to be a despot. So you don't have to worry about mistreatment coming from him. But this master who is worthy of all honor is to give glory and you are to give glory too as well to God and to the doctrine so that nothing will be blasphemed or spoken evil against. Now go to verse 2. Those who have believing masters, that is to say their masters are Christians. Let them, the slaves or bond servants, not despise or look down upon their masters because they are brothers in Christ. Your master is a fellow Christian. So you think if you're not what you ought to be, you think I can get away with things with him. I don't have to listen to him. He's going to let me get by with things. No, rather you are to serve them better because you are under obligation to benefit them and to be benefited by them. They are believers, those masters are. They are beloved because they are fellow Christians. And Paul goes on to say then you need to teach not only teach, but exhort. And exhort means to encourage these things. And the language here indicates a continuing habitual action. You keep on teaching these things. It's often been said that a preacher getting up in the pulpit preaching a sermon or a teacher teaching a class is really not going to say anything new. He's probably not going to say anything you haven't heard before. It's coming from this same book, or it should be. He might say it in a different way. He might divide the passage in a different way. He might use different illustrations and quotations. But when you get back to the basics, if you will, sounds like an old Wailing Jennings song, doesn't it? When you get back to the basics, it's all pretty much the same thing. So you teach and exhort these things 
And the point of all of this obviously is a Christian slave is to faithfully serve his Christian master. That's what this is all about. The master-slave relationship very often in the ancient world and even in the world in America a century or so ago was not ideal. It was not good. It was not what it ought to be. But Christian servants and Christian masters or Christian employers and Christian employees are to treat each other as Christians. That doesn't mean we demand less of people because they are Christian. If anything, we demand more. But we do expect everybody, God expects everybody, better yet, to go under the law of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that takes care of the first two. Now let's go on to verse 3. And here's a long section that goes all the way to the end of the chapter, but we will subdivide it. If anyone teaches otherwise, other than what he said to teach in the preceding verse, and does not consent to or agree with wholesome, healthy, biblical, scriptural words, which are identified here as the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. There is a lot said in that particular statement. There are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 12, 48, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. All scripture is inspired of God. On and on it goes. So there are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and there is the doctrine. Now the doctrine is simply the teaching. And the teaching must be in harmony with godliness or piety. Some translations have it. And not only must it be in harmony with godliness, it must produce a godly life. The Word of God, studied, learned, applied, and lived, is going to produce godly, holy, righteous, Christ-like people. That's the purpose of God giving us his word in the first place. But if a fellow will not consent to wholesome words, verse 4 says he's proud. He's got too big of an ego. He's vain. He's self-conceited. He knows nothing, Paul says. Now, he may think he knows a lot. He may even, you've met a person or two like this in your lifetime, they think they know it all. We have a phrase, a know-it-all. But Paul says, no, you really actually don't know anything and you are obsessed. Now that means you really got a hang up here. You are really, you're just uh, enraptured by all of these things and you enjoy the disputes, the arguments that take place over words. Now, let me, let me talk about that a minute. I've said many times and continue to say, you cannot understand the Bible unless you understand the words of the Bible. I know sometimes when a preacher or a teacher spends a lot of time defining and applying words, people think, boy, that's boring. People think, man, that's tedious. But the point is, you're never going to know what the will of God is so you can live according to that will if you don't know what the words mean. Words have meanings. We learn in communication that a word is a symbol, S-Y-M-B-O-L. That symbol stands for something. We've got to come to understand what it is for which that word and those words stand. Then once we've got that, all we've got to do is apply it to our lives. But if anybody teaches something differently, if he teaches another doctrine, if he teaches a false doctrine, If he does not agree with or assent to wholesome, healthy, sound words, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's words from Jesus, and that's also words about Jesus, and the doctrine which accords with godliness. Your teaching must be according to godliness. Now go on down. If he doesn't, he's proud. He knows nothing. He's obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. Now watch all this. 
from which come envy, let me see if I can give you these, envy means jealousy or suspicion, strife means argument or contention, reviling means blaspheming or railing or slander or putting somebody down, evil suspicions mean that you are suspicious of others and useless wranglings, arguing about things that you don't understand, that you can't explain, that may be beyond your ability to comprehend. I think we can get more worked up over things we don't understand than just about anything. We can argue about things for which there is no answer, for which there is no solution. It doesn't do anybody any good. It just hinders us trying to live the Christian life. Watch these people. These are men of corrupt minds. They're corrupt. We talk about corruption in government, in business, in sports, in every aspect of life. These people are people with minds that are corrupt and they are destitute. When we say somebody is destitute, we mean that they're so poor, they don't have anything. These people are destitute of the truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. They suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Periodically, what we do in this country is we investigate and we expose the big-time preachers, the tele-evangelists, who are making a fortune. How much did uh, Duplantis spend for his latest plane? Wasn't it $53 million? Okay. These guys are making a fortune. And we investigate them. We tell who they are. We tell how much money they're making under false pretenses. And then nobody does anything about it. We let it keep on happening. Uh, I don't want to get into name calling, but I could make a long list of people who are like that. And if you'll get on your TV and start channel surfing like I do, you'll find a house full of them. They're in it for the money, for the fame, for the glory of it. Well, anyway, these are men destitute of the truth. They may have a big bank account, but they're destitute of the truth. While they suppose that feigning feigning godliness is a means of gain. Paul says, don't worry about them. Let them go. Have their own way. No way. From such withdraw yourself, he says. Don't have anything to do with these guys. Stay away from them and make them stay away from you. Now look at verse 6. He says, godliness, we've already talked about what that is, with contentment. The Nestle text has self-sufficiency. Somebody else has a bigger definition. It means independence of circumstances. Well, whatever it means. You know what it means to be content. Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am therein to be content. I know a guy many years ago who left the green hills of Tennessee for the sand of West Texas, and it was a different world altogether, Charlotte. You know what I'm talking about. And many, many times when I walked from my one-room apartment to the college cafeteria where I paid 25 cents for a full meal, can you believe that? Uh, but the sand and the dust were blowing. Sand was getting in your eyes. By the time you got to the cafeteria and got your food and started munching down, you could hear the <coughs> that you'd picked up on the way over there. And I'm serious when I say this. Many times I said to myself, I have learned in whatever state I'm in, therein to be content. Yeah, okay, so it works more ways than one. So godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, the force behind those two phrases put together, we brought nothing into, and we can take or carry nothing out. Strangely enough, the two key words here are into and out. You didn't bring anything into the world. 
You can't take anything out of the world. So just, you know, you try and you labor and you do this and that and the other. And maybe you get into some dishonest things. He says, you've got to be careful about that. Verse uh, 8. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. We have different kinds of foods to eat. We have coverings to wear. And we ought to be able to be content with the things that we do have because those things come from God. If you think about it just a split second, it sounds like you're hearing Jesus right now preach that section of the Sermon on the Mount that begins in Matthew 6 and starts at verse 25, goes down to the end of that chapter, which is verse 34. Uh, All these things, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Philippians 4, 19, Paul says, My God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Okay, so then, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. All right. He says in this particular verse, this is verse 9. I've lost my place here. There it is. It says in verse 9, there are those who are driven by a desire to be rich. That's the driving force in their lives. And they allow themselves to get into situations where they fall into temptation. There is temptation, they succumb to it, they fall into it like it's a trap. And he goes on under the figure of a trap to talk about a snare. Any of you ever back in your younger days set a snare? Trying to catch a rabbit or a squirrel or something bigger like a deer or a bear? Yeah, a snare is a trap. You can fall into temptation, and temptation becomes a snare, and you become trapped. And when you fall into it, you fall into many, watch, foolish, wasteful, good-for-nothing, wastes of time, and harmful. Beyond foolish, they're harmful. They do harm to you not just physically, but more importantly even, they do harm to you spiritually. Foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. The figure here is the figure of a man who gets in water over his head and he cannot swim and he goes under. They say you go under, what, three times? I don't know whether that's true or not. But he goes under. He can't get back up out of there. He goes all the way to the bottom and drowns in destruction, death, and perdition, which probably here refers to the torment that follows. Okay, so he falls into many foolish and harmful lusts that drown men in destruction and perdition. Then this verse, which has often, so often been misquoted, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. As we often misquote this, we say to someone, well, money is the root of all kinds of evil. No, that's not what it says. The love of money, a passion for money, A desire for money or the things money can buy that will drive you to compromise your faith and your person and your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here. The love of money is a root or a source of evil. All kinds of evil, it says. And because of that love of money, many people are driven to do things that are wrong that compromise their Christianity, that take them away from the Lord. There's no sin in being rich. The sin is in letting money become your God. Many, many years ago, I was in school over at Lipscomb with a fellow named George Grinley. 
George was from New Jersey. His father was Eddie Grinley, and Eddie Grinley had started one of those camps up in the Northeast. I don't know whether that camp still exists or not. But uh, George was in college at Lipscomb due to the good graces of Brother A.M. Burton, one of the founders of the Life and Casualty Insurance Company. So one day, George had to go out to see Brother Burton, and he asked me if I'd like to go along for the ride. Well, yeah, I wanted to go along for the ride. I wanted to meet A.M. Burton. So George and I drove out to, I don't even know whether the house is still there or not. But anyway, we drove out to the Burton property and went into the Burton house, and we sat in, I guess it was the den, for a long time and had a really good discussion with that gentleman. I was in his house on at least two occasions, but that's the one I remember best because I was there with my friend and Brother Burton was paying my friend's way through college. But the point is he had made lots and lots and lots of money by being one of the founders of the Life and Casualty Insurance Company. Most of his money went to Lipscomb, uh, went to missions, went to Brother Keeble's Nashville Christian Institute, went to good works all around the world. That man and his wife did a tremendous amount for the cause of Christ. I don't guess he ever preached a sermon. I don't know if he ever taught a Bible class or not. I don't know if he ever conducted an open Bible study or not. But I know his influence by the proper use of his money made him a tremendous blessing to churches of Christ around the world. Okay, so you can use money for good purposes or you can use money for evil purposes. And the persons mentioned here are the people who are using money and wanting to get more money for evil purposes. They've strayed from the faith and their greediness. They've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I have not looked at the clock until I heard that bell. I thought we had a lot more time. We got five minutes. Here we go. But you, O man of God, flee these things that he's been talking about. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. We will not define those. We don't have time. Fight the good fight of faith. That uses the same words that Jude has in the third verse. Is that right? Contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all time delivered to the saints. Contend earnestly is the word from which we get our word agonize. That word appears right here. You fight the good fight of faith, you agonize. I picture in my mind, one of my sons in high school over at Lipscomb was on the wrestling team. And I picture, I don't picture those guys, what's what they call themselves, a National World Federation. or what, I don't know what I'm talking about, those dudes. But these, these, these high school and college guys who are really grunting and groaning and their faces and their bodies are turning shades of deep red because of the exertion. That's what Paul's talking about here. You fight, you agonize the good fight of faith. You lay hold on. You hold on to it so tightly that you're never going to let go. Hold on to eternal life to which you were called by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14 and you've made the good confession. With the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 10. In the presence of many witnesses. That's Timothy's confession. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Jesus Christ. Who witnessed his own good confession before Pontius Pilate. That you keep this commandment to live according to God's will without spot. That you are blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. That's the second coming. When he will, or which it says here, he will manifest or reveal or make known his coming in his own time. He said, I don't even know the day or the hour of my second coming. But he knew he was coming. I will come again, he said. And receive you into myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He who is the blessed and only, let me look this one up, because I'm not sure of, of my definitions here for just a second. What verse is this? This is verse 15. Okay. 
The word blessed can mean happy. It does in the Beatitudes, for example. A potentate. A potentate in the proper sense is one who is powerful, one who is sovereign, one who is a good ruler. This good ruler who is the only potentate, the only real potentate, is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He ranks above every king. He ranks above every lord. He ranks above every other potentate. He is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. Now look at verse 16. He alone has immortality. He's the only one who within himself has immortality. That's an eternal nature. He dwells in or inhabits unapproachable light that nobody can approach to. No man has seen him. No man can see him. Moses saw his backward parts, and that's the best that's been done. To whom be honor and everlasting power forever or everlasting might. Amen. Okay. Then he says in verse 17, Command those who are rich in this present age, this present time, not to be haughty, not to be stuck up, not to be vain, not to be proud, nor to trust in riches because riches are uncertain, but to trust in the living God. I'm reminded of 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, where Paul commended the Thessalonians because they had turned from idols. Why? To serve the living and true God. That's a powerful phrase. He's the living and true God. Sometime go read Paul's sermon on Mars Hill in Athens in Acts 17 and keep that in mind as you're reading that and see how those two compare. Okay, uh, living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. That's eternal life that they may lay hold on eternal life. Okay, Timothy, guard Guard, it's almost a military term. What was committed to your trust? Avoid profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing what is falsely called knowledge, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. We're through. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this night, for the study of your word. Thank you for your word that we have to show us the way from earth to heaven. Be with us, bless us according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for being here. Yes, sir. No, what I, hey, I preached a whole series here on 2 Timothy. Do you forget that? Oh, buddy, you walked into my trap. No. If I'm going to teach 1st, 2nd Timothy, I'll be lucky to finish 1st Timothy, as is obvious. But I'll do 2nd Timothy sometime. <laughs> and we can take a whole quarter on 2nd. I bet. Don't say I bet. I believe, I believe I can spend a whole quarter on 2nd Timothy because of the last two chapters. I really do. Yeah. Wouldn't be hard.